Okay, we're going to talk about mechanical ventilation in pediatrics today. Uh, despite what the date says, I realize that it's actually the 2nd of January, and I'm not sure what uh, happened as I was making this slide. But anyway, so before we start talking about mechanical ventilation, one of the problems that I've always had is that I get bogged down with all the different mechanical ventilation names and modes, and I find that it gets really confusing. And this is really compounded by the fact that we have so many different mechanical ventilator companies, and each one has a different name for the same mode. We have Draeger, uh, Puritan, Viasis, Hamilton, and notice that for each different type of mechanical ventilation mode, they each have a different name, making their making dozens of different names when there really are just a couple of, of different types of modes. The bottom line is that if you really think about conventional mechanical ventilation, it goes it can be broken down into two, if not maybe three different modes. VC, as you see on the left side, that's volume control. PC is pressure control. And then DC is a dual targeted, dual control mode. And yes, there are certainly differences to them in how they're synchronized and whether or not they're pressure regulated and whether or not they guarantee a certain volume. But ultimately, they, many of them are built the same. They all have the same input values and in that in each of them, you're setting the tidal volume, you're setting the PEEP, you're setting the I to E ratio, and you're setting the respiratory rate. In volume control, you set the tidal volume, and then the plateau pressure becomes the dependent variable. In pressure control, you happen to set the plateau pressure, and the tidal volume becomes the dependent variable. But in the end, they're all very similar systems. And the really important thing that I want to uh, emphasize is that the um, name of the mechanical ventilation mode that you're using is not as important as how you set it. And so I wanted to carry that forward as we're talking. Now, when it comes to pressure control and volume control, in general, many of them are set the same way, which is with low tidal volume ventilation. Low tidal volume ventilation, there's a really good reason for that. That's because we have a great randomized control trial that suggests that low tidal volume ventilation um, uh, decreases mortality, and so it's become standard of care. Some more non-conventional mechanical ventilation modes that we're going to touch upon include the oscillator and APRV or airway pressure release ventilation, which is also called bi-level or bi-vent or bipap plus. And then there's a slightly lesser known mechanical ventilation mode, but I think it's a really good mode, which is high frequency percussive ventilation or volumetric diffusive respiration, VDR. Let's start by talking about low tidal volume ventilation. Many of us know this. This is um, the ARSNET trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2000. And I wanted to go through the settings first because I feel like many of us talk about this study without actually recognizing what the settings were. And if we think about standardizing care across all of our mechanically ventilated patients, that's actually a really important point. So the inclusion criteria, these are clearly patients with um, uh, acute lung injury if you're using the old definition or a mild acute respiratory distress syndrome according to the Berlin definition with a PF ratio of less than or equal to 300, bilateral pulmonary infiltrates, and no clinical evidence of left atrial uh, hypertension. And of course, in these days, we recognize that we do not use Swan-Gans catheters as regularly as we did. So the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is no longer really uh, a part of the modern definition of acute respiratory distress syndrome. Then notice they say select any ventilator mode because ultimately the low tidal volume ventilation is about how you set the mode, um, the mode's tidal volume. Here, set ventilator settings to achieve initial tidal volume of eight cc's per kilogram predicted body weight. I can't tell you how many times I've simply put a patient on six cc's per kilogram predicted body weight, but notice that according to the, the original ARSNET definition, you were supposed to start with eight cc's per kilogram and then going to the next um, suggestion, you then reduce the tidal volume by one cc per kilogram at intervals of less than or equal to two hours until you get to that tidal volume of six cc's per kilogram. So it's not something that you automatically do. The other important thing to note is that, again, their patient population were patients with ARDS. Many of our patients who are not necessarily critically ill and do not have ARDS often still get ventilated, immediately put on uh, tidal volumes of 6 or 8 cc's per kilogram. Next important thing is that they did um, to come up with two different PEEP FIO2 scales to help guide us in our titrations according to patient's oxygenation. And we'll talk a little, just a little bit about one trial that compared the low PEEP high FIO2 scale to the high PEEP low FIO2 scale. But this becomes really relevant because again, if we're standardizing care among our ICU patients, then this is a scale that we should all really have well known or documented um, somewhere in our intensive care units. And I feel like many times we don't necessarily follow this. Okay, well, what were the results of the study? Why do we think the study was so important? 
look at these mortality curves. The survival of the um, low tide of volume group you can see is um, marked in the dark uh, black line, and then in the black dotted line is the traditional tide of volume. And you can see that their survival is markedly improved in the low tide of volume group. Mortality weights went from about 40% down to 31%. It's a 9% decrease in mortality rates simply by dialing back the, the tidal volume. Of course, what's really important to recognize is that they're comparing uh, 6 cc per kilogram versus 12 cc per kilogram. The other important thing to recognize with this particular choice is that if you look back at the um, other studies prior to the 2000 trial looking at trying to compare low tidal volumes, when they compared 6 cc's versus 8 cc's or 6 cc's versus 10 cc's or 8 cc's versus 12 cc's, there was no significant difference. Now, be that as it may, there were, they were smaller trials, but they really didn't were not able to establish a difference until they switched it to 6 and 12 cc's per kilogram, which is a pretty big jump. The other important thing is that the ARDSNET trial quotes 12 cc's per kilogram as being the standard of care tidal volume prior to the ARDSNET trial, and that's simply not true. In general, 8 or sometimes 10 cc's per kilogram was considered standard of care, and even authors on the ARDSNET trial have other papers that have, that have been published saying that 10 cc's per kilogram was standard of care. So there have been some ethical articles written about the ARDSNET trial, um, sort of curious as to whether or not this trial was really performed in good faith when they said 12 cc's per kilogram was standard of care, and would they have necessarily even seen the same difference if they'd used the standard of care 10 cc's versus 6 cc's. Just an interesting side note. So they showed, again, a really remarkable change in mortality, and so we would expect that now we're in 2019, this is 19 years after the ARDSNET trial, we should be seeing way um, smaller um, mortality rates as compared with prior to 2000. So this was the LOVE trial, this was published in 2008, this was the Canadian um, Saudi Arabian uh, trial, and this uh, showed mortality rates of 40.4%, which is actually on par with what the um, standard of care, or what they called standard of care, 12 cc's per kilogram was in the ARDSNET trial. The EXPRESS trial had slightly lower mortality, so that's great, 31%. This was published in 2008. Um, this was published by, uh, by Mercat's group. The EXPRESS trial was the one where they um, wanted to look to see if there was a difference between the low PEEP, high FiO2 scale versus the high PEEP, low FiO2 scale, and ultimately did not detect any difference. The Alien Trial published in 2011, this was Vilar's um, group, and they um, this was a, a Spanish trial, and they showed mortality rates of up to 48%, and this is over a decade after the, um, the original ARSNET trial, so certainly there hasn't been much of a change in practice patterns at that time. Patients are not getting unhealthier, yet we still have high mortality rates in spite of using low tidal volume. So this was a really nice epidemiologic study by Bolani. He ultimately, his group wanted to figure out where are we with acute respiratory distress syndrome? How much progress have we made? So what they did was they looked at 50 separate countries, 459 ICUs within those 50 countries over a four week period of time. They found that the ARDS incidence was 10.4% of ICU patients, which equated to just over 3,000 patients. They found that the mortality rates were anywhere between about 30 and 43%, which was about 838 patients. But keep in mind, this was only over a four-week period of time. So you can easily extrapolate this data and say that over 11,000 patients per year um, were developing and dying from acute respiratory distress syndrome. And then the other thing to keep in mind here is that this is only 50 countries. This is less than one third of the countries in the world over only 459 ICUs. And so you can easily say that we're losing over 100,000 lives every year from acute respiratory distress syndrome. So I kind of alluded to the fact that the ARDSNET data doesn't necessarily um, tell us the full picture of what was going on prior to the low tide of volume um, era. But I think the other important thing is to really look back and um, dig into the, the data that they did collect. And so this group really wanted to know, so all those patients who were not involved in the study, in other words, those patients who were treated with what was considered standard of care at the time, which was usually between 8 and 10 cc's per kilogram, how did they fare as compared with those patients who were treated with 6 cc's per kilogram? Now, unfortunately, the authors who were interested in this um, had um, asked of the ARDSNET group the, for the data and were not able to, to acquire it by asking it. So they ultimately um, invoked the um, 
the data by using the Freedom of Information Act and are finally able to analyze the data. And so what we find is that the Arsenet group screened over 6,000 patients for enrollment. It was a really robust trial. And there were about 2,600 patients who met enrollment criteria but were not eligible or for whatever technical reason were not included in the study. And they again received just traditional care. The data was recorded at the same intervals as the other study participants, so we were still able to analyze the data um, as compared with those patients who were involved in the study. Now again, you see that mortality rate in the 12 cc per kilogram group that was higher than the rest, which is at uh, 40%. And then you see the 6 cc per, per kilogram tidal volume at right about that 31%. And then look at the mortality rate, the non-eligible participants. These, are, again, are participants who were not, um, uh, who were incorrectly excluded, who refused enrollment for um, either the patient or the physician. But notice that the mortality rates are precisely or not statistically similar, not statistically different from the 60 C per kilogram tidal volume group. And then the other thing that they did was they kind of reanalyzed the data and said, well, does everyone benefit from a low tidal volume strategy? And so what they did was they looked at those patients with um, lower pulmonary compliance and noticed that if you um, start with a lower tidal volume and you raise the tidal volume, these patients do have a higher mortality rate. If they have a lower um, compliance, you try to push a larger tidal volume in, they end up doing poorly because you end up over distending the functional lung or the functional baby lung that's left. Those patients who started uh, with a slightly um, higher pulmonary compliance and you raise the tidal volume, they actually do better. They have a lower mortality rate because they can accommodate those tidal volumes and can use it to um, both help oxygenate, but more importantly, to also help ventilate. And so what we realize here is that the um, tidal volume is not as important as the functional lung upon which that tidal volume is being distributed. And this ended up coming up, this um, trial, this um, uh, hypothesis really came out um, about 10 years later in 2015 when Amato's group showed that the driving pressure is more important than the tidal volume when they went back to reanalyze the um, the Arsenic data. And it's essentially saying the same thing. Since the um, driving pressure is the change in pressure, and then as we know, change in pressure over change in volume is going to be equivalent to the compliance. And so this um, is something that uh, is now a well-known um, entity. Before we go any further, I think it's really important to understand what lung injury is, because if we understand what lung injury is, then we can really decide how best to treat it or prevent it from happening. And I think when we're talking about lung injury, it's not only important to think about the lung, but also the really important subunits of the lung, the alveoli and the alveolar ducts. So here, this is just a, um, a mechanically ventilated rat lung. And you can see this is a super healthy lung. It's barely opening and closing. And you can see that this, these tiny vol tidal volumes are being distributed evenly across the entire lung. Now, if you zoom in on this lung and put a microscope directly on the subpleural surface of the lung, you can see these alveoli are similarly nice and healthy. They're hardly moving at all. This is what healthy alveoli look like. We distribute a tidal volume across a set of homogeneous open alveoli, and they just barely open and close. This is what happens when you look at injured alveoli. These are alveoli that have had their surfactant washed out, and you can see that they are just popping open and closed with every single breath, and you can imagine how injured that they are. And moreover, you can imagine that with inappropriate ventilation settings, you can actually create even more injury as these uh, alveoli get worn down as they're exercising with every single breath. And then similarly, this is just what the whole lung looks like. And you can see this is just the baby lung that's being ventilated. The majority of the lung is totally collapsed, and just a small part of it is um, is realizing those tidal volumes. And so this was the whole idea behind the low tidal volume strategy, which was that they wanted to protect the baby lung that actually was open and allowing the rest of the lung to collapse. Now, the problem with this strategy, though, is as follows. There's two issues. Now, first of all, again, if you go back to your nice, healthy, open uh, lungs and you look, zoom in on those alveoli, those are nice and open homogenous, you would put in a tidal volume of 6 cc per kilogram, then they all distend homogeneously. Compare this with that injured lung. You have open alveoli adjacent to collapsed alveoli. You put 6 cc per kilogram tidal volume in. Those open alveoli can still have an opportunity to over distend. And not only that, but you leave the remaining alveoli collapsed. So you never really offer a chance for those alveoli to get recruited, but you still have a possibility of injuring the alveoli that are open.
So really, what does it mean to be a low tidal volume? Is it simply that you know you dialed in 60 cc's per kilogram on the mechanical ventilator and therefore you're low tidal volume? And I think the answer to that is no. So using um, the same uh, subplural microscopy technique, what we wanted to do is to visualize the alveoli and mark out how they respond to different low tidal volume strategies with different peeps. And so what we did was we, uh, using an, um, an image um, analysis technique, we were able to identify all of the subplural alveoli. And then using a quantification technique, we were then able to quantify the degree of airspace that we saw in the different peep levels at inspiration and expiration. Just visually, you can see between inspiration and expiration that as you increase PEEP, you increase your alveolar recruitment and homogeneity, which isn't totally surprising. But what is interesting also is that between inspiration and expiration, you can see that even with a PEEP of 5, that those alveoli are getting de-recruited. You can see those two large alveoli right here in the center. At inspiration and expiration, they're very hardly moving, so these two alveoli are relatively open and healthy. But notice this big packet of alveoli. These ones just totally collapse at expiration. Only until you get to the higher peep levels do you get to a point where you don't lead to that degree of atelectasis with expiration. So the tidal volume really doesn't mean as much if you don't have a peep level to go along with it. Now here you can see um, we've identified the tracheal tidal volume, which is represented by the black um, hatched line. And th this, these were, this was a rat study. We ended up doing a 5.5 cc per kilogram tidal volume. And if you look at the alveolar tidal volume, which is represented in blue, you can see that as you're increasing your PEEP levels, your alveolar tidal volume goes down, even though your tracheal tidal volume has stayed the same. Once you get past a PEEP of 16 up to 20 and 24, you don't see that same change or um, improvement in uh, reducing your alveolar tidal volumes. But the important thing here is that the tracheal tidal volume really doesn't mean as much if you don't know how many um, uh, alveoli and the homogeneity of those alveoli upon which that tidal volume is being distributed. So in this particular rat study with this particular um, rat and injury model, a PEEP of 16 was probably the best PEEP strategy for, um, for this animal. So the thing I'd caution here is just that the numbers that you plug into the ventilator don't necessarily translate to what the alveoli and alveolar ducts, which are really the functional working units of the lung, to what they see. So that was a lot about adults. If we move into pediatrics, and unfortunately this is going to be um, a, a theme throughout the entire uh, lecture, we just don't have as much data on pediatrics. The majority of the mechanical ventilation practices that we've inherited in pediatrics, we've acquired or chosen from adult studies. So pediatric randomized control trials of low tidal volume ventilation, there actually aren't any. We only have observational studies. Yet we've acquired and um, adapted the uh, adult studies to pediatrics. So what is our low tidal volume practice pattern? And going into the um, uh, P-Alive um, consensus criteria, when they, um, where they wanted to determine what the um, incidence of ARDSs in children and kind of identify what the practice patterns are, they found that only about 4.3% of patients meet criteria for ARDS. This is less than half of what we find in the adult trial because as you remember from Bolani's um, study, he found that about 10% of their intensive care unit patients developed acute respiratory distress syndrome. What they found in this study was also that um, most uh, centers do apply what they call quote-unquote low tidal volume strategies with a median tidal volume of about 7 cc's per kilogram. What's interesting is that they base uh, their weights on actual weight rather than predicted body weight, which again was recommended by the uh, ARDSnet New England Journal of Medicine trial. In kids, this probably isn't as important because many of the our kids' actual body weight is the same as our predicted body weight, but that isn't necessarily true. They could not establish a PEEP or FI2 gradient um, because of marked variability in practice. And remember that there were those two really well-defined PEEP FI2 scales in the ARSNET trial. And although we don't necessarily all follow them rigidly, they are there in their guidelines that we technically should be following if we're following the low tidal volume trial because of their decrease in mortality. And you can see that you have, we have this really nice bell curve kind of demonstrating the variability in practices for what is called quote-unquote low tidal volume with that peak right around 7 cc's per kilogram. And this study was um, performed or investigated 59 pediatric intensive care units across Europe and North America. But the other thing that I think it's important to know is that in these trials, 
that they analyzed, they found that the title volume was available in only in less than 50% of patients. And to be calling yourself uh, a low title volume strategy and to only quote you know, the title volumes that you're, that you're um, setting in less than 50% just really isn't acceptable. And this brings up another important point that when you look at mechanical ventilation trials and find negative or positive outcomes, one of the most important things you have to do is to go to the method section and to figure out what the settings that they actually used were. Because again, a really great mode set improperly can ultimately lead to poor results. And it doesn't mean that it's a bad mode, it means that the way you're setting it might not be optimal. So that's low tidal volume. Moving on to the oscillator, the oscillator has a little bit more um, uh, clout in the pediatric population as compared with the adult population. It is a little bit challenging to set, and conceptually the idea is you just want to have a little tiny tidal volumes, just try, trying to basically shake the alveoli so that they don't get that injurious opening and closing that we saw in that um, subplural window. There, these tidal volumes then, because they're so small, have to be performed at a high frequency to make sure that the alveoli are still able to ventilate appropriately. And then you want to use modest mean airway pressures, again, to minimize uh, your degree of alveolar barotrauma. And so you can see in the, uh, in the upper graph that we're looking at the frequency, which is measured in hertz. We set the I time, which is the percentage of the inspiratory and expiratory time spent at inspiration, and you modify the percent I time rather than the entire I to E ratio. But in general, the I time tends to be more dependent based on the frequency. And then we set our mean airway pressure, and you can see that you're oscillating around that mean airway pressure. And then on the bottom, you, we're now comparing the um, oscillator tracing with that of just a, a pressure control um, tracing. And you can see the difference. In the pressure control, you have these wide swings in, in between inspiration and expiration. So not only do you need higher um, inspiratory pressure in order to maintain your oxygenation, but you also end up with a large delta or change in pressure between inspiration and expiration. But notice that in the oscillator, even though you're just very gently kind of shaking the alveoli, in other words, not creating these large pressure gradients, you end up with a higher mean airway pressure than the pressure control, simply because you're oscillating around a slightly higher mean airway pressure. Moving on to the specific settings, again, you don't generally increase the I to E ratio, um, and that's due to the concern for air trapping and barotrauma. And the... Um, ratio is usually fixed at about 18 milliseconds. So if your frequency, again, it's dependent on frequency, is 15 hertz, your I to E ratio is about one to three. If your frequency is six hertz, then it's going to um, decrease. It's going to go from inspiratory to expiratory time of one to eight. Starting frequency, you can often kind of predict based on patient size and age. Premature infants, um, less than 2.5 kilograms, will probably start at a frequency of about 10 hertz, and this is from a range of about 6 to 15 hertz. In general, you don't want to go above 15 hertz because you get to the point where um, you're oscillating so fast that you end up with air trapping, and so you can end up with ventilation issues as well. Term infants, you'll usually go to about 15 hertz, which is about 900 breaths per minute, just to give you an idea of how fast these alveoli are shaking. Children 6 to 10 kilograms, about 8 hertz, and then children greater than 10 kilograms, 6 hertz. And again, these are kind of starting general guidelines for your frequency. If you want to treat air leaks or a pneumothorax, you can decrease your frequency, and this will also minimize air trapping and avoid hypocarbia. And if you um, increase your frequency, then you can both increase ventilation as well as improve oxygenation. Amplitude is um, basically roughly equivalent to your alveolar ventilation, and this is the volume of gas that's generated by each frequency range, and this has a large range of between 11 and 51 centimeters of water. And you basically start the amplitude at a place where you can start to see chest wall vibrations, and then you titrate based on PaCO2. If you want to change your PaCO2 by about 2 to 4 millimeters of mercury, then you can increase or decrease, res respectively, your amplitude by 3 centimeters of water. And this is the smallest amplitude change you can make. If you want to change your PaCO2 to about 5 to 9 millimeters of mercury, then you change your amplitude by 6, 10 to 14 millimeters of mercury by 9. And then, of course, you're going to check your blood gas and monitor to see how they responded to your change.
Mean airway pressure is more proportional to oxygenation. The initial settings for the oscillator in the neonate is about 7 to 9 centimeters of water. If you have a kid who has um, respiratory distress syndrome, then you'll start slightly higher, between 10 and 12 centimeters of water. Whereas in infants and children, you're going to start about 15 to 18 centimeters of water. If you're transitioning from conventional mechanical ventilation, which is usually how these um, children are, um, are placed in the oscillator, then you usually set your um, mean airway pressure about two to four centimeters of water above the mean airway pressure on your conventional mode. And then in infants and kids, you um, would set your, ma your mean airway pressure about four to eight centimeters of water above that of your conventional mode. In the setting of decreased oxygenation or epoxy, you can increase your mean airway pressure by two to four centimeters of water. You can start using Cybress, and you can also increase your FiO2. The problem with simply increasing the FiO2 is you're basically just treating the number. You see a low oxygenation, so you increase the FiO2, but you're not necessarily improving oxygen delivery. You're not necessarily improving lung recruitment, which is presumably the reason that there's hypoxia to begin with. So FiO2 can be used, but it doesn't necessarily help the overall pathology of the lung. And then the thing that's really great that we do in PEDS is we follow the chest x-ray. And this is a really important point that we don't necessarily do quite as much in adults. Uh, we do certainly look at the chest x-ray, but we don't look for lung expansion to guide our, um, our airway pressures. If you have a, an appropriate lung volume of 9 to 10 ribs, you can imagine that your mean airway pressure is probably at a good, um, at a good safe zone. If you're seeing uh, 11 or even to your 12th ribs and you have flattened diaphragms, it suggests that maybe the mean airway pressure is too high and you can probably back down off of it. And then weaning. We'll start weaning um, the FiO2 until it's about less than uh, 50%. Once the FiO2 is less than 50%, that's when you can start decreasing your mean airway pressure by about one centimeter of water every four to eight hours. If you lose your oxygenation, then you can increase your mean airway pressure by three to four centimeters of water again to restore your lung volume. And then again, you can start weaning, but this time you try to um, do it slower, draw it out longer, or go by smaller increments. When you're at a minimal mean airway pressure, in other words, less than eight centimeters of water with an FiO2 of less than or equal to 40%, this is when you can consider converting to conventional mechanical mode. Some people will choose to wait until the child is bigger, um, um, either like less than 2.5 kilograms or even um, up to two and a half kilograms. Let's look at the evidence we have uh, behind using the oscillator in adults. In the same year, in 2013, two individual uh, separate randomized controlled trials came out looking at the oscillator compared with conventional mechanical ventilation. The first we'll, we're looking at is the OSCAR trial. This was performed in England, Wales, and Scotland over 29 intensive care units, and they compared high-frequency oscillatory ventilation versus, again, low tidal volume ventilation, with the primary outcome being uh, all-cause mortality at 30 days. And so the patients that they included were those with uh, moderate to severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, PF ratio of less than 200, requiring a PEEP of greater than or equal to 5 centimeters of water, bilateral pulmonary infiltrates, no evidence of left atrial uh, hypertension, and those that were expected to require greater than or equal to two days of mechanical ventilation, with the idea that you really can't uh, draw meaningful comparisons with those who are uh, mechanically ventilated for less than 48 hours. And they excluded those patients who required mechanical ventilation for um, uh, for more than uh, seven days prior to the study onset. Those, unfortunately, were aged less than or equal to 16 years, which is, of course, our pediatric population. Again, those patients, um, they included were those with moderate or severe ARDS. Um, so again, this is really a trial for adults. Uh, and they excluded those individuals weighing less than 35 kilograms, and somehow they managed to exclude both patients that had obstructive and restrictive lung disease, which is pretty challenging, um, but that's uh, what their methods suggested. And here's what they found. We're looking at the mortality curve going from zero to 30 days, and you can see that the conventional ventilation and the oscillator are essentially spot on each other. And as you can imagine, this was actually almost more of a, a defeating result for those um, who advocate for the oscillator, those who believe that those tiny tidal volume excursions are protecting the lung by uh, preventing large um, displacements uh, in volume of those alveoli. But regardless, it does show that it's at least equivalent to the um, conventional mechanical ventilation. Moving into the oscillate trial, also published in the New England Journal of Medicine, again, also in 2013. This was uh, published in including 39 intensive care units across five countries, Canada, Saudi Arabia, the U.S., Chile, and India. This was also uh, patients with moderate to severe ARDS new onset. 
again comparing the oscillator to low tide of line ventilation. And unfortunately, the trial was stopped at just um, 548 patient enrollment out of the um, expected 1,200 patient enrollment, and that was due to the in-hospital mortality. The oscillator had a mortality at that time of 47% as compared with uh, control, which is 35%. And so the trial was stopped due to futility and um, concern that the um, treatment mode was actually causing more harm. And if you look at the survival curve, this is going up to 60 days. Look at the control versus the oscillator. We can see that their survival rates are markedly higher in the control groups. This was, of course, even more disappointing for those individuals who are advocates of the oscillator. But I think that these trials serve to show um, an important fact, which is, again, that the mechanical ventilation mode itself is not as important as how you set the mechanical ventilation mode. If you ask me to set the oscillator, on a patient and you set me even with relatively um, rigorous protocols, I can guarantee you that I will not be able to mechanically ventilate that patient as optimally as someone who has years of experience on the oscillator. It's not necessarily an intuitive mode, and despite under having a baseline understanding of it, there are some fine titrations that I may not understand not having used it very frequently. And so my results are not going to be as good as someone who feels very comfortable with it. And so I think the problem with some of these randomized large control trials is that we are almost forcing people to use mechanical ventilation modes that they themselves may not be as comfortable with and therefore may not end up with um, as good of outcomes as those modes that they are comfortable with. Um, and so I think that we should take these studies with a grain of salt because I do believe that the oscillator is a really good mode when it is set well. So what is our evidence in the pediatric population? And the oscillator, and this is true in both pediatrics and adult populations, is largely considered a rescue therapy. If we look at this prospect of randomized clinical trial, this was performed in five tertiary um, uh, pediatric intensive care units. They compared the oscillator to conventional ventilation in 70 children. But of course, this means that it was underpowered to detect any significant differences. The results were inconclusive. Patients were enrolled three to six days into their course, which potentially means that they've already developed some degree of ventilator-induced lung injury. And the other important thing is that these individuals were not analyzed in their initially randomized group. Of those people who started on the oscillator, 38% were converted over to conventional ventilation during the study period. And of those who started on conventional ventilation, 66% were transitioned over to the oscillator. And so it's difficult to be able to um, comment on any real differences between these patients. So that first article was published by Arnold um, in 1994, and you'll find his name quite a bit in the pediatric uh, oscillator literature. In 2000, this was sort of a follow-up study in which we looked at uh, 10 tertiary pediatric intensive care units. This was over an 18-month study period. This was more of an observational study and um, basically kind of showing where we're at in terms of the oscillator mechanical ventilation in children. And they found that 49% of pediatric intensive care unit admissions required mechanical ventilation, and only 2.9% of them were treated with the oscillator. The other thing they noticed is that patients who were starting on the oscillator, again, a mean of 3.3 days into ventilation with an oxygenation index of 34 to 36. But we know that an oxygenation index greater than 35, um, especially within the setting of immune compromise, has the greatest predictive power for increased mortality risk. And this was actually also published by um, Dr. Arnold just a few years later. So we're essentially um, treating these patients with the oscillator perhaps a little bit too late, but again, it's difficult to then come up with any real conclusions of the oscillator when we're treating sicker patients with it. Now, there wasn't anything wrong with this study because this, again, was just more of an observational study, but it does serve to show that we use the oscillator as a rescue mode. And in the um, uh, PALIC uh, consensus conference, uh, which um, was a, a group of pediatric um, intensivists, uh, emergency medicine physicians unfortunately was not represented by any surgeons in this conference, these uh, individuals came up with consensus um, criteria for mechanical ventilation and acute respiratory distress syndrome definitions in pediatrics. And one of the consensus they came um, up with was that high-frequency oscillation uh, should be considered an alternative ventilatory mode in hypoxic respiratory failure in patients in whom plateau pressures exceed 28 centimeters of water in the absence of clinical evidence of reduced chest wall compliance and should be um, used in patients with moderate to severe pediatric acute respiratory distress syndrome. So they do not advocate for the use of the oscillator as a routine mechanical ventilation mode, but it's never actually been studied as a routine mechanical ventilation mode. The neonatal population, even more than the pediatric population, is where we see the oscillator used a little bit more. 
Um, there are lots of small trials um, looking at uh, the oscillator in neonates, but no large, truly large randomized control trial. Um, and so in this case, I'm going to show um, a Cochrane review, which in general I, are not my favorite, but because there are so many small trials, and this was a very well-conducted Cochrane review, this is the one that I'm going to, to use to, um, uh, to demonstrate what uh, our literature uh, evidence is. So this looked at randomized controlled trials that compared the oscillator versus conventional ventilation. They looked at 28 studies, and of those studies, 19 of them were included, and this ultimately equated to um, over 4,000 infants. And you can see the mortality rate at 28 to 30 days was essentially the same comparing the oscillator versus conventional ventilation. There was no significant difference between the two with a confidence interval um, between 0.88 and 1.34. So although the mortality rates were similar, some of the other things that they found was that chronic lung disease was decreased with the oscillator, but of course this was inconsistency across, inconsistent across studies. They found that pulmonary air leaks were increased in the oscillator, and so there is um, sort of a slight negative connotation with the oscillator when it comes to air leaks. But the truth is the oscillator itself is not a, uh, or excuse me, air leaks are not a, itself a contraindication to using the oscillator. You just have to alter your frequencies and amplitudes to, um, to justify its use. And then uh, the interesting thing, and I don't necessarily have a, an etiology for this except for perhaps oxygenation, severe retinopathy of prematurity was also um, decreased in the oscillator group. So that's the oscillator. Next, let's talk about APRV, or airway pressure release ventilation. And anyone know, who knows me knows that I really enjoy using airway pressure release ventilation, and I'll talk about why. The settings are not quite intuitive in that their settings are not set the way that um, conventional mechanical ventilation set is set with tidal volumes and rest stray rates and I to E ratios. And it's not set in our typical um, breathing pattern where you have a roughly one to three inspiratory to expiratory pattern. So just comparing the mechanical ventilation waveforms, we're looking at the pressures on the x-axis and time on the y-axis. If you take your low tidal volume ventilation, you notice you have a brief inspiratory time and a prolonged expiratory time. APRV is essentially flipped, where you have a longer inspiratory time and a shorter expiratory time. Now, if you take your airway pressure at low tidal volume, you take that and add on one or two centimeters of water, and that will give you your P high, or your pressure um, at, the, at the higher pressure for APRV. Your P low you set to zero centimeters of water, and this is really important and it's also somewhat counterintuitive. On the one hand, the idea is that we certainly don't want the lungs to collapse down to a P low of zero, which will propagate atelectasis and increase our delta P with each inspiration uh, to expiratory phase. So the key here then is the time at which we set our um, our T low, or the time that we're set, at, the time upon which we're at our P low. We have to make sure we set it brief enough so we never let the lung collapse to that P low. So how do we do this? The T high is usually set to about 90% of the ventilator cycle. 100% of the ventilator cycle is the I plus E, and then the expiratory time, the T low. That's where um, where there's a little bit of finesse when setting airway pressure release ventilation. So how do we set T low in APRV? First, we look at the expiratory gas flow. In other words, we look at how, um, how fast or the flow at which the, the lung exhales. And so we can see this is in liters per minute. And in this particular example, we're going from zero to negative 100 liters per minute. And so you can imagine that a patient with a really um, restrictive, uh, restrictive lung is going to exhale um, their gas volume at a much faster pace than someone with, say, obstructive lung disease. So if we set our T low according to the patient's lung physiology, we can sort of guarantee that they don't collapse down to that P low of zero and that we maintain adequate tidal volumes, uh, excuse me, adequate um, residual volumes at the end of expiration. So we're going from a time of zero in this example just up to 1.2 seconds. PEF is the peak expiratory flow. Now we could set the flow wave to terminate at 25% of the expiratory flow. In this example, that's at 1.2 seconds. But that ultimately means that we're letting 75% of the lung collapse, and we don't quite want that. We could terminate at 50% of the peak expiratory flow, and that gets us to 0.8 seconds. But this, again, allows too much of the lung to collapse, and we worry about um, losing our recruitment that we had at that um, extended P high phase. What we found, or rather what Dr. Abashi has found, is that if we terminate this expiratory flow, and this is in the general population at 75% of your peak expiratory flow, in this example at 0.4 seconds, we can optimally um, 
maintain recruitment of the lung even at expiration, so we don't achieve a P-low of zero. And in fact, what he's shown is that if we set that termination rate at 75%, that usually the um, actual end expiratory pressure, instead of being a P-low of zero, it's usually about half the P-high. So if your P-high is set at 20, then usually you're going to end up with an expiratory pressure of about 10 centimeters of water if you terminate at 75%. And so that's what our goal is. And this is Dr. Abashi's general guidelines that he published in Critical Care Medicine 2005. These are really specific. And so I think it's important to recognize that, again, just like the low tidal volume strategy, we do have a protocol for setting airway pressure release ventilation. And just because someone says that they're using the mode APRV, if they're not using APRV in an, optimally, in an optimal fashion, they could potentially be injurious, just as using the oscillator in... Um, uh, in a fashion that's not standardized, or saying that you're using low tidal volume ventilation but then not actually reporting your tidal volumes. So how do we set up APRV? In pediatrics, in a newly intubated patient, we set your P high at our desired plateau pressure, and that's going to be somewhere between 20 and 30 centimeters of water depending on the patient's underlying lung physiology and how, you, how sick you think the lung is. A P high could, a greater than 30 centimeters could be necessary, and of course we all think of the plateau pressure of greater than 30 centimeters being injurious. But the truth is, when it comes to static pressure, it's not as important as the dynamic pressure change. A static pressure of uh, 30, a greater than 30 centimeters of water isn't necessarily injurious as long as you're keeping the delta P relatively small. Again, we set our P low of zero centimeters of water. T high set about three to five seconds. T low, roughly 10% of the ventilator, um, mechanical ventilation phase, but more important to titrate according to the flows. In other words, according to the patient's own lung physiology. If you're transitioning from conventional ventilation, which is the way the majority of patients are because many can still consider APRV a rescue mode of ventilation rather than a primary mechanical ventilation mode, You'll take the plateau pressure in the volume cycled mode, and I would even add on one or two centimeters of water on top of that when you're switching over to APRV. P low you set to zero, T high three to five seconds, T low of 0 0.2 to 0 0.8 seconds, titrating as needed. And then transitioning from the oscillator, you take that mean airway pressure, and then you add on two to four centimeters of water. And then same P low, T high, and T low settings as we discussed before. Setting up in the neonates in a newly intubated patient, again, you set at your desired plateau pressure, which is going to be slightly lower than that of your pediatric patients, usually about 10 to 25 centimeters of water. P low of zero, T high two to three seconds, and T low of 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 seconds. In babies, because they do have a higher respiratory rate, they do require um, slightly shorter T highs as compared to their pediatric and adult counterparts. But again, you also will titrate your T low similarly, especially those patients with respiratory distress syndrome. They have really restrictive lungs and they really need tight T lows in order to maintain um, lung volumes at expiration. If you're transitioning from conventional ventilation, again, you take that plateau pressure of the volume cycled mode, and again, I would consider adding on maybe one centimeter of water on top of that. Same P low, T high, and T low settings as we discussed. And then transitioning from the oscillator, you'd take that mean airway pressure and add on somewhere between zero and two centimeters of water. And then again, those same P low, T high, T low settings, all titrating according to your blood gases. One of the things that I think it's important to note here is that we do not talk about respiratory rates. Certainly the um, T high and T lows will make a respiratory rate, but we don't necessarily set a respiratory rate. We set the P high and P low, and we can titrate them according to oxygenation and ventilation, but we don't use a respiratory rate and we're not restricted by the rate itself. So what evidence do we have in adults? And sadly, we don't have any um, good randomized controlled trials. Randomized controlled trials are maybe not surprisingly, but they are very difficult to, um, to come by, to produce, and then also to fund. One of the difficulties, and this is true of all institutions, is that because of inter-institutional variability, it becomes very difficult to standardize large multi-institutional randomized control trials. The evidence that we do have, this is one um, neat study that looks at trauma patients. Before I go into the study itself, though, I want to um, give you an idea of uh, what degree of, of injury these, these individual, these tra trauma patients have. And so to do that, I'm going to look into um, Gajic's LIPS score, the Lung Injury Prevention Score, in which he basically identified... Um, uh, a predictive pattern for patients in terms of being able to determine how likely they are to develop acute respiratory distress syndrome according to uh, their underlying injuries.
So for instance, if you have a patient who comes in with pneumonia and shock, that's 2 plus 1.5 is 3.5. They have 3.5 lips points, and then you can predict what their mortality rate is. And so you can see in the bottom panel that the higher the lips points, the greater the chance you have um, acute lung injury or acute respiratory distress syndrome. So for greater than or equal to 8, you have a mortality, or excuse me, an incidence of about 35, uh, 36%. Now, in the panel of patients that I'm about to talk about, those who were treated with airway pressure release ventilation, they had a lips points of 8.6, which would predict an incidence of probably about 37%, according to Gajic's study. Now, in this trial, they compared um, trauma patients who were treated at the Maryland Shock Trauma Center with airway pressure release ventilation against um, tens of thousands of patients, uh, trauma patients in the adult literature who were treated with more conventional quote unquote, uh, mechanical ventilation modes. And you can see the incidence of acute respiratory stress syndrome. This is a box plot pattern. And you can see that there's a marked variability in the incidence from anywhere from almost 0% to 35%. And the patients in the APRV group, those treated at the shock trauma center, you can see that they had an incidence of um, acute respiratory distress syndrome of just 1.3%, 1.3%. And again, these were the, the patients who had lips points of 8.7, predicting mortality of more of, excuse me, an incidence of more like 37%. Now, if you look at the in-hospital mortality, again, we're looking at another box plot. If you look at those patients who were treated with airway pressure release ventilation, you can see that their in-hospital mortality rates were the lowest of all of those studied at just 3.6%. And this is, again, in the era where patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome we know have a mortality rate of about 30%. Um, the other important thing to note is that in these patients who did have an in-hospital mortality, these patients died with healthy lungs. They were not dying because of respiratory distress. They were dying for other reasons. This was a, a study that was performed in uh, China, and they looked at the early application of airway pressure release ventilation and tried to determine what the um, differences were in acute respiratory distress syndrome um, according, uh, compared to low tidal volume ventilation. So here we're looking at the plateau pressure. We're looking days um, after enrollment on the x-axis. APRV is represented by the orange triangles, and low tide volume is represented by the green circles. And we can see that in the APRV group, the plateau pressures that were required were actually smaller than those in the low tidal volume group. If you look at the mean airway pressure, again, the green triangles represent APRV. The mean airway pressure is higher in APRV, even though the plateau pressure is lower. And that's because of the extra time that you're spending at your plateau pressure. So even though the lungs are not um, going to a higher pressure, they're exposed to a greater um, degree of pressure, potentially allowing for additional recruitment while not necessarily causing injury to the lung. And then if you look at the PF ratio, you can see that both groups started with uh, a moderate acute respiratory distress syndrome with a PF ratio between 100 and 200. And over the course of the study, both of them have an improvement in their PF ratio as we move on to seven days. But in the APRV group, we not only come into mild ARDS, but many of the patients even recover from their acute respiratory distress syndrome, while the majority of patients in the low tide of Lyme group stayed in uh, moderate acute respiratory distress syndrome. And then you can see that the respiratory system compliance also improved in the airway pressure release ventilation group, also sort of consistent with our hypothesis that APRV is able to recruit the lung and um, with the, the higher mean airway pressure. And then the percentage of breathing patients without assistance, you can see that the APRV group um, is also higher and statistically significantly um, greater than that of the low tidal volume group. Moving into pediatrics and neonatology. This was just a small series that was performed by the Children's uh, Hospital of Philadelphia. They looked at um, children who weighed greater than 8 kilograms, just 15 patients, and they just compared SIMV versus airway pressure release ventilation. Unfortunately, they had no description of their vent settings, and so regardless of whether these results are good or bad, this always makes it difficult to interpret the study because they did not uh, mention the vent settings that they used. They excluded those patients with obstructive airway disease, uh, congenital um, or acquired heart disease, mechanical ventilation greater than seven days, and FIO2 greater than 50% for greater than seven days. And here's what they found. 
They found that the peak inspiratory pressures were lower in airway pressure release ventilation as compared with volume control, and this is consistent with the, the Zhao China study in the adult population. And similarly, the plateau pressures were also lower in the APRB group, sort of consistent with the idea that you don't need higher pressures because you're spending more time at your plateau pressure, you still end up with a higher mean airway pressure. So what they concluded was that using airway pressure release ventilation in children with mild to moderate lung disease resulted in, com in comparable levels of ventilation and oxygenation at significantly lower inspiratory peak and plateau pressures. This was a randomized control tr uh, trial that was published in India, and they looked at uh, children who were aged one month to 12 years. There's a slight problem with this in that children who are one month have a slightly different uh, lung physiology as compared to those who are 12 years, in which alveolarization is, all, is still happening, and it also doesn't really account for how many of those individuals who are one month were also born preterm. So there's a little bit of a, a mixture in the patient population, which can um, muddy the waters to some extent. They use the Berlin definition to uh, def define those patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. The, this was a single center study with a 15 bed intensive care unit and it was performed over a two and a half year period. And they said the trial was terminated after 50% enrollment in after just 52 kids when the analysis revealed a higher mortality in the intervention arm, the intervention arm being airway pressure release ventilation. These were their exclusion criteria. Uh, air leak, increased intracranial pressure, which is, by the way, not an exclusion criteria for using airway pressure release ventilation, poor spontaneous breathing efforts. This is also not necessarily something that I would consider to be um, um, an exclusion criteria because it's so difficult to control for spontaneous breathing anyway. It can both help or harm um, the, the patient depending on the mechanical ventilation mode, um, but not necessarily good exclusion criteria. Those patients with chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease, greater than 24 hours after ARDS diagnosis or after 72 hours after ventilation. And they also said that all enrolled patients were transferred to the intensive care unit within two hours of randomization for initiation of the allocated mode of ventilation. I'm not really sure where they were treating these patients um, outside of the intensive care unit that were being mechanically ventilated, but I would certainly be interested to find out. So again, I've mentioned we have to look at the methods. So these are the methods. Um, just a couple of important things to look at. Um, if PPLAT could not be reliably determined, I don't know that I've ever been in a position where I was unable to determine the plateau pressure. Um, usually if you do an inspiratory hold, that's a really good way of, of determining it, but for whatever reason, the authors had difficulty with this. And then they said the time spent at the P high, in other words, the T high was set at four seconds, and that's totally reasonable. It's a reasonable starting place. They said the PHI was adjusted to maintain a release tide of volumes of 6 to 7 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. At no point in Dr. Abashi's recommendations did he say anything about tide of volumes. We do not use APRV and then target a tide of volume. If you're targeting a tide of volume, then it's a low tide of volume ventilation mode. It is not airway pressure release ventilation set according to Dr. Abashi's method, which is time controlled adaptive ventilation. So they basically masked APRV in sort of a sheep's clothing by making it a low tidal volume mode. Uh, what they did do is that they looked at the domes of the diaphragm to verify that the, um, the ninth um, uh, posterior rib, if it was visible and the, the diaphragm was flattened, they'd come down on their pH, and that was an absolutely appropriate thing to do. And as I mentioned, it's, it's a very valid form of, of helping to guide you in your mechanical ventilation settings when you're using your chest x-ray. But as you can see, they really didn't use APRB according to the to the set protocol. And so they, again, did have a higher mortality using APRV, the mode name, but setting it inappropriately. Looking into neonates, this was just a small study. They looked at five infants um, of uh, 24 to 28 weeks, so very premature, less than 1.5 kilograms, and they uh, found that these infants tolerated APRV well and did not uh, demonstrate any adverse events. And certainly this is just nice to, to know to show that it, this is safe in infants, but what I thought was more interesting in this study was this great table that they came up with demonstrating the number of pediatric APRV publications as compared with adult APRV publications. And what you can see here in the adult APRV, these are represented by the, um, the dotted boxes. Look at how many more randomized control trials they are in APRV as compared with pediatric, where in 2001, this is the only year that they actually show some randomized control trials. And over 1,000 um, trials in the adults versus just 111 um, in the pediatric population. So there just, again, is not a lot of literature on mechanical ventilation. And 
APRB is used even less in kids and neonates as compared to adults, just 1.6% as compared to 11.3%. Now, what the study quoted um, was, while APRV appears to be used for a variety of indications, again, it's still just a rescue mode. The last um, part that I want to talk about was um, a study that, that I did when I was in the research lab. And this was a study that I was really, really proud of, mainly because it was just um, so difficult to put together. It didn't really have the great results that I was expecting, and I think this more has to do with um, getting more used to the model and, and, um, and managing baby piglets. But I do just want to go through it because I'm real proud of it. So basically, we used preterm, a preterm piglet model of respiratory distress syndrome and applied airway pressure release ventilation, again, just to show that one, it's safe, and two, to see what the differences were against conventional ventilation. So how did we decide what size piglets to use? Looking at um, porcine lung physiology, we can see that, first of all, piglets are at 115 days are considered full term, so that's equivalent to a 40-week human infant. Piglets breathe spontaneously from about 90% to 100% of their gestation, or 104 to 115 days, which is equivalent to about a 32-week human infant. So we knew we couldn't use those, those piglets. We know that their surfactant is uh, decreased, if not absent, at less than 100 days, or 87% gestation, which is equivalent to about a 28-week human infant. And we know that all piglets require mechanical ventilation at about 97 days. So we ended up choosing to... Um, uh, birth preterm piglets between 90 and 99 days, which is roughly equivalent to a 25-week human gestation, knowing that they'd most likely not be able to breathe uh, independently and that they would also be deficient in surfactant, and that this would mimic a human infant with respiratory distress syndrome fairly well. And then again, we've seen this before. These are the, the curves for volume guarantee and airway pressure release ventilation. And you can see how much more pressure the lung is being exposed to in APRV without necessarily having a higher plateau pressure. And so our idea was that in these infants who have um, poorly formed alveoli, who are surfactant deficient and unable to breathe on their own, having that extra pressure without causing injurious pressure could potentially benefit them and mitigate some of the um, uh, effects of respiratory stress syndrome and improve oxygenation. So preterm piglets were delivered at 85% of their 115-day term by a cesarean section. They were all instrumented similarly with a tracheostomy, umbilical artery catheter, umbilical vein catheter, and orogastric tube, and were resuscitated with ANCEF, maternal plasma, uh, were provided parenteral nutrition, and then they received albumin or lactated ringer boluses as needed and they were monitored continuously for 24 hours. And as you can see here, we have a sort of a little piglet neonatal intensive care unit. They were all totally um, anesthetized throughout the entire um, experiment to make sure they were incredibly comfortable. They all have their individual mechanical ventilator. They all have their individual uh, fluid pumps. They're all being monitored continuously. And you can see that they're in a neonatal isolate for thermoregulation. Here's what we found. We're going from T0 to T24, which is our study endpoint. We're looking at the plateau pressure. The plateau pressure in volume guarantee and airway pressure release ventilation was statistically similar uh, across the study. The FiO2 bo in both cases was started at 50%, and you can see we were able to wean down the majority of them to even 21% in airway pressure release ventilation, whereas in volume guarantee, they sort of stayed around 50%. The PF ratio um, was statistically higher in the APRB group as compared with volume guarantee. And you can see that they all started with a baseline uh, PF ratio of just about 50 to 100 because their lungs were totally collapsed at birth. And the compliance, this was kind of the key thing in the APRB group, was markedly improved as compared with volume guarantee. Again, suggesting that we're able to recruit some of those collapsed surfactant deficient uh, alveoli. And you can see grossly that in the volume guarantee group, there were regions of atelectasis and adjacent to regions that were nice and open. On the x-ray, you can see that there was um, more lung collapses compared to the APRV group, and the APRV group were nice and pink, healthy, and fluffy. The one thing I will say in the APRV group is those diaphragms are a little bit on the flat side, and so in this case, um, it would not not have been a bad idea to come down on the plateau pressure in this particular piglet. For lung histology, uh, what we see, the control group, these were animals who were sacrificed immediately, and so you can see that there are no distinct alveoli. Um, the walls are, are very thick and uncellular. In the APRV group and the volume guarantee groups, again, we do not have a fully alveolarized infant, but we can see that the walls are less thick than in the control group, even less so in the APRV group as compared to the volume guarantee.
And if you look at the cellularity within the, the alveoli or the um, alveolar ducts themselves, there was more cellularity in the volume guarantee group with more inflammatory cells as compared with airway pressure release ventilation. The mortality rates were slightly higher in the APRV group as compared with uh, volume guarantee, although it wasn't statistically uh, significant. And I do wonder if this, is ju again, just comes down to management and getting used to, um, to running a, a piglet neonatal intensive care unit. So hopefully this is something that we'll be able to learn a little bit more about and study a bit more in the future. The last mode that I want to discuss is that of high-frequency percussive ventilation, also known as um, volumetric diffusive respiration, or VDR. And this is a really neat mode because it kind of combines the principles of conventional mechanical ventilation and the oscillator. And so you can see on the top, this is kind of your conventional mechanical ventilation where you have a brief inspiratory time and a longer expiratory time, which is sort of naturally how we breathe. Um, in the HFPV waveform, which is set below it, you can see that there's basically an oscillatory waveform that um, goes on top of that of the uh, conventional mechanical ventilation. And it's a essentially a high frequency time cycled pressure ventilator and it allows for pneumatic control over the pressure flow and volume relationships to optimize interpulmonary gas distribution but with a percussive burst. And so the idea here is we want to limit barotrauma as well as over distension but promote oxygenation and again with the idea that you're sort of just gently shaking the alveoli. Um, and unlike the oscillator where the amplitude oscillates around a mean airway pressure the um, in the HFPV waveform they use a, a high flow interrupter to stack the oscillatory breaths on top of a, a baseline peep to a selected inspiratory pressure followed by a passive exhalation. And so this also assists with um, endobronchial secretion removal. So this is a really great mode, especially for things like burns or if you do have a lot of mucus uh, secretions, great for mucus movement. Unfortunately, if you look at our evidence for using HFPV, HFPV in adults, and pediatrics, we just don't have it. And part of this is due to, to marketing and uh, lack of, of study and research, but I genuinely believe this is a great mode and something that I think we'll hear a little bit more about in the future. Dr. Adele Bugatev is a neonatologist who comes out of, Brus out of uh, Belgium, and he's really finessed the technique of setting HFPV. And I think if we hear a little bit more from him in the future, which I do expect we will, that we're gonna be um, having this on our radar uh, more often. And so I just want to finish with a couple of general um, thoughts, which is that, again, current pediatric mechanical ventilation practice is based on adult practices. And the challenges with developing pediatric mechanical ventilation studies is that, again, ARDS is relatively infrequent, especially as compared with adult ARDS. We saw that it um, occurs with less than, with, with less than 50% incidence as compared with adults. It's difficult to recruit patients. Um, clinicians are not necessarily as apt to want to study on patients and of course, parents and family members are less excited about um, involving their children in studies. To really get the power that you need, you really need 12 to 16 participating sites. And again, it's difficult to maintain standards across so many sites. And usually to, again, from a power perspective, you need about a four to five year period. So what we end up doing is we just end up cherry picking those adult practices that, uh, that we feel like adopting, but we don't have any great studies or literature to support those practices. And as we all know, children are not little adults. Number two, there is no best mechanical ventilation strategy. The best mechanical ventilation strategy is that which the clinician feels comfortable with, knows how to use, and has good outcomes themselves with. And I think that trying to find a one-size-fits-all approach is not going to be realistic. Each lung has a different pathology. They have different um, flows, restrictive versus uh, obstructive lungs. And so simply applying a low tide of volume and saying this is going to work for everyone, I just don't think is realistic. And finding mechanical ventilation um, strategy that is adaptive to the patient's physiology. And again, we know that I like APRV, but really any mechanical ventilation mode that takes the patient's underlying physiology and allows you to change the settings accordingly, I think is going to be a good mode. And then the last thing, and this is um, this is one of my biggest um, pet peeves, is really thinking about microventilation instead of macroventilation. Setting numbers on the mechanical ventilator is not really sufficient unless you really think about how those settings are impacting the um, the microenvironment, the alveoli and the alveolar ducts, which are really the working elements of the lung anyway. And finally, we'll just end with some questions. <laughs> 
Question one, a 65 year old woman is on a mechanical ventilator because of bilateral pulmonary contusion from blunt trauma. Oxygen saturation is 88%. The mechanical ventilator can be used to help increase the fraction of inspired oxygen. What other setting on the mechanical ventilator can help improve oxygenation? Increasing the positive end expiratory pressure. This is not only a really important practical principle to know, this is also a very high yield test question, especially for the abscite. Positive end expiratory pressure mitigates end expiratory alveolar collapse, increasing oxygen exchange. Increasing the respiratory rate, tidal volume, and minute ventilation will improve ventilation, but not oxygenation. Question two. A patient with acute respiratory distress syndrome is on mechanical ventilation. During rounds, the team increases the positive end expiratory pressure from eight to 12 centimeters of water. Which of the following parameters is likely to also increase? Functional residual capacity. Positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP, increases arterial oxygen content by increasing functional residual capacity by recruiting alveoli. Cardiac output can decrease due to increased positive end expiratory pressure due to the increase in intrathoracic pressure, which then results in decreased venous return to the heart. PEEP increases intrathoracic pressure, thus decreasing preload, and does not affect carbon dioxide. Because PEEP increases arterial oxygen content, as previously described, um, on a repeat arterial blood gas, you'd expect to have an increase in the partial pressure of oxygen. Question three. A 45-year-old man is intubated in the trauma bay because of a GCS of nine and closed head injury. He weighs 80 kilograms. What should be the initial tidal volume for the ventilator? five to seven milliliters per kilogram. When it comes to test taking strategies, the only randomized control trial that we have right now that demonstrates a decrease in mortality is low tidal volume. And so five to seven or sometimes six to eight cc's per kilogram will maybe be the answer, is always going to be your answer for this. So I would almost ignore everything else um, that we, I really said in this, um, in this talk when it comes to your test taking strategy. Um, but again, do keep in mind that this patient with a closed head injury does not necessarily have acute respiratory distress syndrome, so it does not even necessarily meet the um, original patient population uh, on whom the low tidal volume ventilation strategy was trialed, just as a side note. An 18-year-old severely asthmatic male is struck by a motor vehicle and undergoes open reduction and internal fixation of the left femur. Postoperatively, he's unable to be extubated. He started on inhaled steroids for severe bronchospasm and maintained on a ketamine infusion postoperatively. His ventilator settings include a peak inspiratory pressure of 33 centimeters of water, PEEP of 5 centimeters of water, tidal volume of 6 cc's per kilo, respiratory rate of 12 breaths per minute, inspiratory time of 1.5 seconds, and FiO2 50%. The measured plateau pressure is 22 centimeters of water. His most recent arterial blood gas is 7.08865, and his end tidal CO2 reads 50 millimeters of mercury. What would be the most appropriate next step in managing this patient? Decreasing the inspiratory time to one second. The patient has severe obstructive disease and evidence of acute exacerbation that's demonstrated by the large peak in steroid plateau pressure gradient, uh, which is 36 minus 22, which is 14 centimeters of water. Also, the patient's demonstrating significant dead space due to hyperinflation and air trapping as demonstrated by the large PaCO2 to end tidal CO2 gradient. As a result, the patient requires an increased time for exhalation, and this can be accomplished by decreasing the respiratory time. Conversely, increasing the respiratory rate will potentially improve ventilation, but would exacerbate exhalation, potentially lead to a little auto peep, and can worsen the hypercarbia. Finally, expiratory time can be increased by decreasing the inspiratory time, and increasing peep can improve oxygenation, but will not improve the underlying hypercarbia. Lung protective ventilator setting calculations for tidal volume are based on which of the following? We talked about this. Predicted body weight. Findings from the ARDSNET uh, trial form the basis for administering lung protective ventilation strategies, as we know.
Uh, tidal volumes are set using the standard calculation of predicted body weight based on the gender and height of the patient in order to approximate the patient's normal lung volume. A 36-year-old male was resuscitated from hemorrhagic shock after blunt trauma, resulting in major pelvic fractures, bowel perforation, and intra-abdominal bleeding. He had a laparotomy for bowel resection, ligation of mesenteric bleeding, and internal pelvic bone stabilization. By hospital day 6, the PF ratio is 68, in other words, severe ARDS. He's failed both APRV and pressure control inverse ratio ventilation due to significant hypercarbia with a PCO2 of 76 millimeters of mercury. You can see his chest x right here. The intervention that reduces mortality in severe ARDS and would provide the most immediate benefit to this patient is. We actually have not talked about this in this topic, but it's another really important um, thing to know. It just hasn't been studied in the pediatric population. Prone positioning. Okay, so let's go through all these. First of all, prone positioning or proning um, can improve your ventilation perfusion mismatch by placing the best ventilated anterior lung segments in the posterior position where pulmonary blood flow is the highest. Gravity can allow for improved alveolar recruitment in the now newly anterior lung. So you get an hourglass phenomenon um, as mucus and fluid can slowly shift from the upper to the lower segments. And this not only allows consolidated lung to be open, but it can permit some secretions to be removed by suctioning and bronch. Uh, we've had two meta-analyses of randomized control trials that have demonstrated mortality and severe ARDS in patients managed with proning. So I've said that low tidal volume ventilation is really the only mechanical ventilation strategy that's demonstrated a significant decrease in mortality. Prone positioning, not as a mechanical ventilation strategy, but as a strategy, is um, the other one. And then going through the others, um, as we know, high-frequency oscillation um, provides very, very low tidal volumes, but with high frequencies. And so this ultimately increases mean airway pressure, recruits alveoli, and decreases alveolar overextension. So it can provide rapid improvement in oxygenation, and, but is often considered a salvage therapy in patients who failed conventional methods. We saw the Oscar and Oscillate trials in 2013, which demonstrated that there was no mortality benefit with the oscillator as compared to conventional ventilation. We've tried steroid therapy for uh, ARDS because of the theoretical benefit of um, reducing inflammation, um, especially in the fact that ARDS is often a pro-inflammatory phenomenon. Um, studies that were performed prior to the ARDSNET trial demonstrated um, that there might have been a benefit, um, but in 2006, the same ARDSNET group demonstrated within a randomized control trial of solumedrol versus placebo that... Um, Although there were improvements in the cardiopulmonary physiology in the steroid group, there was no overall mortality benefit. Um, what they also found is that patients who uh, were on Cyamedrol and enrolled for 14 or more days after the ARDS onset, they tended to have a high, significantly higher mortality. So steroids are no longer um, considered a treatment. Uh, ECMO, or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, um, there's been a relative resurgence of ECMO um, in the treatment of ARDS, and this is in part due to improvements in safety um, and technique, and in part due to the, the CSER CESAR trial. And this was a randomized control trial that showed that there was um, an improved mortality in patients with acute respiratory stress syndrome who were randomized to the study arm um, when they were in an ECMO specialty center. Uh, 68 of the 90 patients who were studied uh, received ECMO, um, though the mortality comparison was done as an intent to treat analysis using all 90 referred patients compared to 87 managed with conventional methods. Although promising results, we really do need more study, and in the current scenario, logistical considerations would delay any potential benefit to this patient. And finally, inhaled nitric oxide, which is a pulmonary vasodilator and also a free radical scavenger, does improve oxygenation in ARDS and other causes of hypoxemic respiratory failure, but it has never demonstrated a positive effect on mortality. Question 7. One hour after receiving two units of O-negative packed red blood cells, a 60-year-old male complains of shortness of breath. Vital signs show a temperature of 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit, heart rate of 90 uh, beats per minute, blood pressure of 98 over 60 millimeters mercury, respiratory rate of 30 breaths per minute, and uh, SpO2 of 87% on 3 liters nasal cannula. Chest x-ray shows bilateral fluffy infiltrates and no enlarged cardiac silhouette. You're concerned the patient most likely has. 
Trally, Transfusion Associated Acute Lung Injury. And this is um, supported by the fact that the patient has an elevated temperature, tachypnea, hypoxia, and x-ray findings of bilateral fluffy infiltrates without evidence of an enlarged cardiac silhouette. In other words, no um, primary cardiac failure. An antibody-mediated reaction can occur during the transfusion of blood products. Um, Uh, but usually occurs during the actual transfusion. Although transfusion-associated circulatory overload is a possibility, you certainly expect the patient to be hypertensive and have other signs of volume overload, such as swelling, enlarged cardiac silhouette, and chest x-ray. And so um, A is not correct. The patient is likely to have associated pulmonary contusions from his trauma, but given the temporal relationship to the blood tr product transfusion, this is less likely. And so answer D is probably not correct. And really, it makes trally or, or option C the best answer. Question 8. A septic patient in respiratory failure has developed severe acute respiratory distress syndrome with a PF ratio of 100. He was being mechanically ventilated on a pressure-regulated volume control mode with an appropriate low tide of volume for a lung protective strategy with peak inspiratory pressures of 40 centimeters of water, 90% FiO2, and 20 centimeters of water peep. Nitric oxide nitric oxide was started at 20 parts per minute and the decision was made to try an advanced ventilator mode. The patient was placed on airway pressure release ventilation with a P high of 30 centimeters of water, a P low of 0 centimeters of water, a T high of 4 seconds, and a T low of 0 0.8 seconds with 100% FiO2. His SpO2 improved to 100% and an ABG 30 minutes later shows a respiratory acidosis with a PaCO2 of 70 millimeters of mercury. What changes could be made to the initial APRV settings to help decrease the hypercarbia? Okay, for those people who are um, not advocates of APRV, one of the reasons that they are not is because this, because of this very question. It's somewhat counterintuitive. Um, let's just quickly go through the answers, and then we can go through a little more of the explanation. So first of all, they set the TLO relatively high at 0 0.8 seconds. This is someone who's very, very sick, who probably has restrictive lung disease. This is someone that I would err on the side of a shorter TLO, like even shorter than our usual starting of about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 seconds. So I think, yes, I actually would decrease the TLO, but not for the reason that this question is asking, which is for hypercarbia. Decreasing the TLO is going to improve oxygenation. It's going to improve oxygenation by making sure that the um, lung does not deflate fully at the end expiratory pressure, so it maintains recruitment. Decreasing the PI. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to this one. Increasing the PLO. Okay, we already talked about this. We do not set PLO anything other than zero centimeters of water. The reason for this is that, yes, we have to titrate the T-low very precisely to make sure that we don't let the lung fully collapse that P-low of zero, but the most important thing is that we want to make sure that we have maximal flow so that we can exhale all of that carbon dioxide. So over that prolonged P-high, we're allowing mixing of oxygen and carbon dioxide at the level of the alveolus. And as oxygen diffuses out into the, um, into the circulation, CO2 is accumulating in the alveoli, essentially creating a gradient from the proximal trachea and bronchi, with, which are oxygen saturated from the mechanical ventilation, to the alveoli, which are now carbon dioxide rich. So the carbon dioxide from the alveoli are going to migrate up towards the trachea and bronchi, while the oxygen from the trachea and bronchi are going to mig migrate down to the alveoli. So the P high and the T high are actually, or rather the T high is allowing for enough time for that diffusion to occur. But that means that at the termination of that T high at the beginning of the T low, we want to have maximal flow so that all that CO2 that's accumulated proximally has an opportunity to, to get uh, exhale. So you do not want to put a resistor or an additional P low on it because that can potentially lead to hypercarbia. So then, that, but then that kind of ultimately answers the question. So in order to improve ventilation, we actually need to increase the P high or increase the T high or both. Because by increasing either the P-high and or the T-high, we're going to maximize our alveolar recruitment, which means we're going to maximize our oxygen and CO2 exchange, so we have more CO2 that's able to be exhaled during that T-low. So increasing the P-high is the answer in this particular um, question. You'll notice that in APRB, we talked about this before, the, we do not set a tidal volume and we do not set a respiratory rate. 
in conventional mechanical ventilation, when we want to decrease the CO2, the first things we do are we increase the rate or we increase the tidal volume, we increase the minute ventilation. And in APR, we, we do not do that. And so again, this is one of the major misunderstandings uh, with APRV, but by increasing the P-high and T-high, you can achieve very effective ventilation. Question 9. A patient suffered a major aspiration event and developed respiratory failure while in the hospital after being admitted with a small bowel obstruction. She was subsequently endotracheally intubated and placed on mechanical ventilation with a PRVC mode. Soon, despite 100% FiO2 and 20 centimeters of water peep, she was only able to maintain an oxygen saturation of just below 80%. Aggressive manual bag valve mask ventilation would increase her SpO2 to 95%. She was placed on nitric oxide at 20 ppm with high-frequency oscillatory ventilation. The initial settings chosen for the oscillator were FiO2 100%, mean airway pressure 30 centimeters of water, frequency of 6 hertz, and amplitude 70 centimeters of water. Her hypoxemia slowly improved, and her SpO2 is now 85%. Which of the following would allow for further improvement of her um, oxygen saturation and help wean the FiO2? FiO2 or oxygenation is going to be improved by increasing FiO2 or mean airway pressure. Ventilation is improved and controlled by increasing amplitude initially and then by decreasing frequency. The oscillator contains a diaphragm that oscillates a constant biased gas flow through the airway. The speed of oscillation is set by adjusting the frequency where 1 hertz equals 1 breath per second. Changes in frequency are inversely proportional to the amplitude and delivered tidal volume. Frequency is adjusted in 1 hertz increments based on the PaCO2 between 3 and 7 hertz. The amplitude or power can generally be started at 20 centimeters of water above the PaCO2 or at 70 and adjusted up to 90 centimeters of water based on the PaCO2. The mean airway pressure can be started at 5 centimeters of water above the last plateau pressure and adjusted by 2 centimeters of water based on the SATs, but usually to no higher than 40 centimeters of water. So the answer here is we would increase the mean airway pressure to improve oxygenation since we've already gone up on the FiO2. And once again, going up on the FiO2 treats the number, but it doesn't necessarily treat the disease pathology that's causing the hypoxia. Question 10. A 58-year-old male with underlying COPD is struck by a motor vehicle and sustains multiple bilateral rib fractures with underlying contusion. He is admitted to the intensive care unit but develops progressive respiratory failure over the next 24 hours requiring intubation. The patient is placed on volume control ventilation at a rate of 16 breaths per minute, tidal volume of 600 cc's, which is roughly 8 cc's per kilogram, inspiratory flow of 60 liters per minute, PEEP of 5 centimeters of water, and FiO2 50%. When his sedation and paralysis for intubation wear off, the patient appears agitated, tachycardic up to 140 beats per minute, and hypotensive, systolic of 80 millimeters of mercury. His respiratory rate is 35 breaths per minute, and his SATs are 85%. On exam, he demonstrates bilateral inspiratory and expiratory wheezing. Positive inspiratory pressure is 45 centimeters of water, plateau pressure is 35 centimeters of water, and ventilator graphics demonstrate that the expiratory phase does not return to zero. The patient is treated with bronchodilator, sedation, and IV fluids. However, he remains in respiratory stress. What ventilator changes should be made? Okay, so the key here is that one sentence that the ventilator graphics demonstrate that the extra flow does not return to zero. This indicates air trapping and probably a severe obstructive disease. So emptying is slowed, um, and this increases the risk of air trapping in, in an obstructive pathology. Eventually, that air trapping reaches an equilibrium at a higher functional residual capacity, and this causes positive alveolar pressure at the end of expiration, or auto peep. This condition is caused by reduced elastic recoil, high tidal volumes of respiratory rate, increased airway resistance, or expiratory flow limitations. Auto peep is not apparent by observing end expiratory pressure because the expiratory port opens and allows the excessive volume to escape. Therefore, when static equilibrium develops, the pressure display will be zero and end expiration until extrinsic peep has been added. Simple observation of ventilator graphics showing airflow failing to return to zero at end expiration is the key to recognizing auto peep. In the absence of graphics, auto peep can be measured by performing an end expiratory hold and inspecting for an increase in airway pressure as the trapped air tries to escape. 
To manage auto peep, minute ventilation should be reduced by decreasing tidal volume or respiratory rate, increasing the IFR to allow for an extra time long enough to achieve lung emptying, and applying extrinsic peep to alleviate the increased breathing effort that auto peep imposes on respiratory muscles. So increasing tidal volume or decreasing IFR will prolong the time for inspiration, thereby reducing expiratory time and exacerbating auto peep. So the answer here is we want to decrease the tidal volume, increase your um, IFR, and then add on a little bit of PEEP. Question 11. A 21-year-old male is admitted to the intensive care unit with multiple left-sided rib fractures and grade 4 splenic injury managed with angioembolization. He develops progressive respiratory failure. Arterial blood gas results reveal a pH of 7.35, PCO2 of 43, PO2 of 68, and an FiO2 of 70% on volume control ventilation with a rate of 28 breaths per minute, tidal volume of 400 cc's, PEEP of 8 centimeters of water with a plateau pressure of 25 centimeters of water, a static compliance of 22 mils per centimeter water, and a minute ventilation of 11 liters per minute. A chest x-ray shows bilateral diffuse edema in four quadrants. Which of the following supports a diagnosis of severe ARDS? The oxygenation PF ratio of less than or equal to um, uh, 100 millimeters of mercury. And the key here was the term severe ARDS. So our previous definition of ARDS relied on what we've already talked about, which is the bilateral pulmonary infiltrates lack of uh, cardiac etiology, and then based on the PF ratio. The old definitions that a PF ratio less than or equal to 200 was um, consistent with ARDS, whereas a PF ratio of less than 300 or above 200 was acute lung injury. And the problem with this definition is that one, it doesn't stratify the degree of acute respiratory distress syndrome because a person with a PF ratio of 199 has a really different pathology and mortality rate as compared to the patient with a PF ratio of 50. The other thing is that by also stratifying acute lung injury versus ARDS, it suggests that they're dis dis distinct disease entities rather than a spectrum of, uh, of a disease. And ARDS is not something that's present or is not. It's really something that's there, and the question is how severe is it? And so in 2011, um, the American European Consensus Conference uh, came out with um, further diagnostic criteria for ARDS, which is called the Berlin definition. And so it discards the use of the term acute lung injury and instead divides acute respiratory stress syndrome into mild, moderate, and severe based on the degree of hypoxemia. So PF ratio less than 300 is mild, less than 200 is moderate, and less than 100 is severe. And so in this case, the severe ARDS was, again, that oxygenation PF ratio of less than or equal to 100 millimeters of mercury. And then again, the additional elements that we um, that they included, in addition to the um, bilateral pulmonary infiltrates and lack of a cardiac pathology, was the timing of onset within one week of a known clinical insult or newer worsening uh, respiratory um, symptoms. And what they found was that incorporating additional variables such as higher PEEP, radiographic compliance, or dead space variables really didn't improve the validity of the construct over just the use of oxygenation. So oxygenation still remains the mainstay for the diagnosis of ARDS. And finally, question 12. A 41-year-old male presents with a large bowel obstruction due to an obstructing ascending colon cancer. He undergoes right hemiclectomy and endoleostomy to relieve the obstruction. During induction and intubation, the patient has a severe aspiration episode. There is severe hypoxia during the operative procedure, and he presents to the intensive care unit with a PaO2 of 55 millimeters of mercury on an FiO2 of 100%. Tidal volume of 640 cc's, which is equivalent to 8 cc's per kilogram, respiratory rate of 15 breaths per minute, and PEEP of 5 centimeters of water on volume control ventilation. The initial ABG demonstrates pH of 7.32, PaO2 of 48 millimeters of mercury, PaCO2 of 43 millimeters of mercury. What initial ventilator changes should be performed if volume control ventilation is to be maintained? And here we are again at the low tide of volume ventilation trial. So aspiration and rapid development of acute respiratory distress syndrome should be treated rapidly with decreasing tidal volumes to 6 cc's per kilogram or even less based on lung compliance. And what I didn't show initially is that the ARDS protocol will even allow you to go down to tidal volumes of 4 cc's per kilogram if you are not meeting your, um, your PaCO2 um, goals.
As a result, the patient's respiratory rate should be increased to minimize associated development of hypercarbia and the PEEP increased so that it, we can open up those collapsed alveoli and improve oxygenation while minimizing alveolar collapse and continued barotrauma. And that's everything. Thank you guys so much for your attention.